My name is Gregory Denny, and I'm with my partner, Rob Solt, and we're going to talk about the 2017 changes to the Ohio Workers' Compensation Act today. Uh, we are with the law firm of Bugby & Conkle with our office here in Toledo, Ohio, and we have been representing employers both in the workers' compensation area and in general employment and labor law for almost 70 years now. Uh, Rob and I have been practicing together in excess of uh, 30. Uh, as things stand now, Rob is uh, devoting his entire time to handling all matters in the agency, and I am devoting my uh, entire time in defending employers in the court litigation that our office handles throughout the state. So having said that, why don't we start with talking about substitute House Bill 27 uh, and this year's changes to various provisions. Rob? Yeah, thanks, Greg. Uh, we're going to talk today about a bill that Governor Kasich signed on June 30th of uh, this year. The bill has some changes. I can't tell you that this is the, uh, a major change that we've had in some of the years past, but there are some significant things that are important to you. First thing to know is the effective date of this law is September 29th, 2017. So that's when all of this will apply. So until then, you don't need to worry about these things, but after that, you need to be aware of these. Uh, as with most, law, most laws, this law is intended to be provided or be uh, interpreted and applied uh, prospectively. Now, there may be some exceptions to that that we'll talk about a little bit today, but for the most part, this applies to cases or claims that happen after September 29th of 2017. Uh, the last thing is there is a, a fair amount of information here about uh, PEOs and group rating and some of the actuarial reporting uh, changes. Those aren't part of the presentation today. I would suggest if you have questions on that, you would contact your TPA directly, or if you like, you can call us and we will try to help you out with those things too. But we're going to try to talk about more of the substantive provisions today as we go through this. As we um, do that, we're going to go through the various uh, provisions of the law that have been changed and talk about them. The first one I'd like to talk about today is the statute of limitations. And as a lot of you probably know, uh, currently we have a statute of limitations of two years for injury claims, occupational disease claims, and death claims, which can both be the result of an injury or an occupational disease. And there's case law that interprets that, that can extend the time and some other things. The primary case is White v. Mayfield, as some of you may know. Well, uh, the legislature has changed that. So, Greg, why don't you tell us about what the change is? Yeah, the uh, statute of limitations for an injury claim and also for a death claim has been reduced to one year. The two-year limitation on an OD claim remains the same at two years. Uh, personally, I was a little surprised at this change, um, but, but not completely surprised. As you know, with the death, it's clear. The death claim has to be filed uh, one year after the date of death. With a specific incident or injury, somebody falls down or is in an auto accident or uh, gets hit over the head with, uh, with an object, that's also a very easy claim. One year from that day, the individual has in which to file the injury claim. The more difficult issue and the issues that we as attorneys get involved in is not so much the length of the statute of limitations, but when does the statute begin to run? In, in OD claims, it's the date of disability, which can be a number of different dates, uh, usually when lost time begins, although it can be diagnosis or medical treatment. Air type injuries, and the question is, Although we have a one-year statute of limitation for injury claims, on a wear and tear situation, when does the one year begin to run? I would, I would suggest that it probably will be interpreted similar to that of an OD claim, date of disability. Yeah, I, um, excuse me, I think that's right. 
The other thing that, <clears throat> excuse me, that is relevant to this is oftentimes when you have claims for um, occupational disease and, and, and some of the death claims, the lawyers will play a game uh, to as to when they file the claim. And the reason they do that is if they're successful, there will be a large accrual, sometimes in excess of two years. They can wait two years and then the claim doesn't get adjudicated for a long time. So there's a big war chest that's created. Uh, this will reduce that in some situations. So you might want to keep that in mind as you're going through. The next thing we want to talk about is uh, drug testing. And drug testing has been around for a long time. And Greg's going to talk to you a little bit about the old law, and I'll talk about some of the changes here. Yeah, let me just review where we are currently and where we have been as far as uh, drugs and how they can cause a claim to be denied and disallowed. Under point 54, that, there's a rebuttable presumption that is created. Uh, rebuttable presumption is nothing other than the shifting of the burden of proof in a claim. In essence, and I'll, I'll, go, I'll go through this rather summarily, if an employer posts the required written notice to its employees that refusing a drug test or the results of a drug test may affect the receipt of workers' compensation benefits, that notice is posted appropriately. And if the employer has reasonable cause to suspect an employee uh, is under the influence of a controlled substance, not supplied by his or her doctor, or is intoxicated, or is under the influence of marijuana, then a qualifying drug test would be in order. And the present version of point 54 lays out a number of controlled substances, uh, different levels uh, for being under the influence. And if that drug test is given, and if the person uh, tests positive, then a rebuttable presumption is created under the law, and it will then be the claimant's burden to prove that the injury was caused by the incident or accident at work rather than being under the influence of drugs. Having said all of that about the rebuttable presumption, sometimes it's very hard to prove uh, that there's reasonable cause to suspect somebody is under the influence. Uh, 54 also provides that if somebody is under the influence and the, being under the influence is the proximate cause of the injury, then the claim is denied. The person is not entitled to benefits. So despite the rebuttable presumption that's created under point 54, uh, an employer should always keep in mind that a, if a drug test is administered, even if it's not a qualifying drug test under 54, i.e. the employer may not have had reasonable cause to suspect, if the reading is such and a doctor, preferably a medical review officer, uh, takes a look at the situation and writes a report to say that the proximate cause of the injury was the drugs, then the employer wins that claim and you don't need the quote qualifying drug test to succeed. It's the employer proving directly that proximate cause does not exist rather than forcing the claimant to disprove the presumption that it does not exist. Rob, how is the new law changes that? Well, it changes it a little bit. It's not as significant probably as a lot of you may think. Uh, first and foremost, all the things that Greg just discussed involving rebuttable presumptions, proximate cause, and notice, that's all the same. What we have changed or what is being changed are some of the levels that you need in your blood uh, to be considered under the influence. And what we've done is uh, the legislature has determined that we're going to use the Federal Department of Transportation standards. Uh, previously, the standards that they have and some of them that we had in the Ohio statute were different, which created, created issues. And I've had several of those hearings over the years as to what standard applies. Now we're using those standards. However, there are a couple 
uh, substances that uh, essentially are not addressed by the Department of Transportation. Uh, those include barbiturates and methadone and benzodiapanines. I didn't say it correctly, but you know what I'm trying to say here. And those, uh, we have our own stat standards in Ohio because that's there. And, and as all of you probably know, methadone is a drug that's a, a big issue uh, in the state of Ohio now. It's getting a lot of publicity. So the bottom line is we're trying to standardize uh, the amounts that are there. I think Greg made an excellent point as we talk about this, is even if you don't qualify, and this is, I, so many employers forget this, even if you don't qualify under the statute with reasonable suspicion or the level, that doesn't mean that you can't still win on proximate cause. So if you're going to spend the time to have a drug test and look at this, I think it's well worth your time to consider saying this to a physician uh, uh, and having a review as to the issue of proximate cause. Um, drugs are a big issue in Ohio. They're a big political problem, and a lot of people are hurt by them. So uh, I think that's something you really should consider. Rob, point 54 was also uh, amended as far as <clears throat> people in prison. Uh, that's right. Um, as some of you may know, um, we decided a long time ago as a matter of policy that if you're in the joint, you don't get paid your compensation. And that at one time uh, was different as far as uh, whether you were in a county uh, facility, a state, or a federal provision. That was changed a few years ago, so if you were incarcerated, um, you didn't uh, get paid. The question that was out there was, what about your dependents? And, and that would come up in the scenario where uh, your uh, spouse was killed and you're retired to, entitled to a survivorship benefits. Do you get paid if you're incarcerated? And Greg, what's the new law say about that? Well, not surprisingly, uh, for deaths occurring on and after September 29 of this year, any dependent who is entitled to death benefits under an allowed claim, who is incarcerated for violation of a state or federal criminal law, is not entitled to receive death benefits during the period of incarceration. So it, it pretty much makes the law consistent with, uh, makes claims consistent, both OD claims, injury claims, and death claims now. No compensation or benefits payable during periods of incarceration. One thing I wanted to do before we go to the next slide, because uh, we didn't discuss this and we had talked about where the appropriate place to place this is, firefighters. There has been a change with the firefighters in Ohio. And as, as many of you know, um, there is currently a rebuttable presumption uh, that exists that if a firefighter has been exposed to at least six years of hazardous contact, then his cancer, if he develops a cancer, specifically a cancer, not other issues, would be presumed to be uh, a compensable situation. Well, the rebuttal presumption, they've changed the time frames on this a little bit. And this, this isn't a drug issue. This is an exposure issue. And what they've done now is after the effective day of this new law, they've said that if you have competent scientific evidence that the exposure or the type of uh, cancer eligible uh, element that was alleged did not or could or did not cause uh, this con this uh, condition, then you can rebut that presumption with evidence. And uh, in claims after uh, September 29, 2017, uh, if it, it does not apply if it's been more than 20 years since the firefighter was assigned, currently the standard is of uh, is 15. So. Um, there's a, a slight tweak on that, and I think the other thing that some of you may know that deal with uh, these types of claims, uh, science is an evolving area, and what causes cancer is a lot of dispute. And if you don't have scientific evidence, uh, then you don't have a basis and you can challenge this. And, and oftentimes what was happening is... Uh, a doctor would simply say it, but there was no literature or science to support what they're saying. So this is giving you an ability to challenge that if you have some really strange situation um, without an exposure. And there's other ways to rebut it, but I wanted to point that out if we could because I, I didn't address it before. Okay, speaking of medical, let's talk about medical exams and waivers. Greg, why don't you tell us what the current law is? Yeah. Current law is if you have a, if you have a claimant, 
who has received 90 days of temporary total disability compensation, the administrator is under a duty to refer that claimant for a medical examination on the issue of the continuation of temporary total. That examination, like I say, is mandatory and it has to take place within 30 days after the expiration of the 90-day period. Uh, our, our experience has been that oftentimes an employer has to nudge the, the Bureau's medical section to get these examinations scheduled, although the law uh, requires them, uh, it just doesn't always happen automatically. Uh, if, the, if the medical examiner for the Bureau finds that the claimant is still entitled to temporary total disability compensation, under current law, the Bureau doctor will, will determine when the reexamination will take place and will recommend a reexamination date. But that has been changed somewhat by the by House Bill 27, and Rob's going to let you know how that's been tweaked. Yeah, I think it's been changed in a very practical way that makes sense. Um, essentially, if you have a situation where an examination is a waste of time and money, then you don't have to do it. And the Bureau, that, that can be done by the administrator. They can decide that. The employer has the right to object to that. And if they do, there will be an exam. But let, let's take a, a scenario where uh, I break my leg and I have it broken in three different places. It's really clear that after uh, 90 days, I'm still having major problems. They're using a bone stimulator. Pick out your scenario. There's lots of them. And an examination is clearly going to say I haven't reached max medical improvement. This allows that a requirement of examination to be waived. And I think it makes sense uh, for everyone involved. Um, you know, everybody wants workers to get better and get back to work in a timely manner, but you don't need to be dragging people to exams when the answer is obvious. And that may also come up in some of the respiratory cases um, involving mesothelioma or some of those things. So um, I think it's a good change uh, for all people involved. All right. Um Temporary total disability compensation and the full weekly wage. Uh, uh, what's current law on that? Well, the current law, essentially what happens is that a lot of times the wages don't get calculated timely and the guy doesn't get paid because the employer doesn't submit the wage statements in a timely manner. And um, that presents a problem, especially if you have a good claim, you know, people want get the person paid, get the benefits going, get it all happening. And uh, presently, that doesn't always happen if the wages aren't submitted. The new law makes some changes, Greg, and why yeah. don't you tell us what those are? It, is really, it really makes a lot of sense. If an employer has not submitted the necessary wage information for the Bureau to calculate uh, the full weekly wage of the injured worker, and the injured worker is clearly entitled to temporary total disability compensation based on the medical evidence, then the new law provides that the injured worker will receive the statewide minimum, one-third of the uh, statewide average weekly wage, the temporary total minimum amount, until the wages are obtained and the FWW is calculated. Uh, if, in fact, uh, the claimant was not paid enough after the FWW, FWW is calculated, then the Bureau will pay the difference and will adjust. If, in fact, the claimant was paid more than he or she was entitled to based on the FWW calculation once wages are received, uh, the new law provides for the overpayment and recoupment uh, as any overpayment would be recouped under 0.511 uh, of, the, of the Act. So an adjustment is made one way or the other. The key is getting the compensation to this uh, individual who is entitled to it and who, whose employer has not uh, timely uh, sent in the wages. The next thing we're going to talk about is a dismissal of a permanent partial disability application. And as those of you who practice in this area are quite aware, this is a very uh, important issue, especially for our friends on the claimant's side. This is how they make their money on permanent partial disabilities in large part. 
The problem that's come up is that in a lot of these claims, you'll have a claimant that uh, doesn't show up for an examination, maybe isn't even aware of what they're supposed to do because the lawyers will sometimes, just as a matter of course, schedule them after the waiting period has occurred for an examination with the Bureau and file an application. Well, what's happened currently, under our current law, is these claims sort of go into what I call la-la land. They don't get processed, nothing happens, and technically what's supposed to be happening is they're suspended. How long does the suspension last? Well, that's a good question. Um, the suspension, can it last longer than the statute of limitations for the claim, five years? Uh, if there's been no additional payment. There's lots of questions concerning that. And so what the new law has done uh, is to hopefully clarify that. And Greg's gonna talk to you about what the new law does. Yeah, what the new law does is very simple. If a claimant fails to respond to the um, Bureau's request to schedule an examination on the C-92, or if the claimant fails to attend the examination without any explanation of why the claimant did not show up, then the C-92 will be dismissed without prejudice. The claimant will be able to refile that C-92 application. However, it will not date back to the filing of the original application. It will not toll the Industrial Commission's continuing jurisdiction. So if the refiling occurs after uh, a five-year period from the last payment of compensation or a medical benefit, uh, that claim is closed down and the C-92 will never be processed. So the refiling is subject to the Commission's continuing jurisdiction and the dismissal without prejudice by the administrator does not toll the jurisdiction of the Commission. So it's an effort to, uh, to clean up and to avoid having many of these C-92 applications hanging out there in suspension when the claimant does not show up for an exam. Now, the law also, on the next slide, the law also deals with claims where the dates of injury or disease predate the change in law, but we have a suspended C-92 application for whatever reason. In those situations, what the law provides is that the administrator is to give notice to the claimant at their last known address that the C-92 application will be dismissed unless the employee schedules an examination with the uh, Bureau's medical section within 30 days after the notice. If the claimant does not contact the medical section to schedule an exam, or if an exam is scheduled and the claimant does not show, they blow it off, then the administrator can dismiss that application, and it'll be without prejudice again, but it is subject to the commission's continuing jurisdiction, there is no tolling, and the refiled uh, application does not date back to the original application. Uh, it is subject to uh, the date is filed and may well be untimely if filed too late. Yeah, and the way I've read this, and it's interesting, I don't think the uh, Bureau really has to give them notice. If they just don't do it, they don't have to send out a bunch of notices saying we're gonna dismiss or suspend your claim. They can just do that um, themselves. So uh, it puts a burden on the claimant to pay attention to what he's doing and claimant's lawyers obviously too. Okay, appeals to, to trial courts in Ohio, Rob. Yeah. The uh, law changed that a little bit. What, what, what do we currently deal with? Well, I think, and Greg and I'll talk about this a little bit here, but currently the law is pretty clear. You have 60 days from your receipt of the Industrial Commission refusal order to file an appeal to court. And that, there essentially are no exceptions to that. It's very simple, it's cut and dry. Use it or lose it, it's very simple. That's what the law is today. So claims with the dates of injury on 929.17 or later, there is a new jurisdictional time limit. There can be a new jurisdictional time limit of um, 
150 days to file a notice of appeal to the appropriate trial court from a final order of the commission. The uh, law provides that once we have a final order of the commission, either a refusal order or if the commission actually hears the uh, appeal and issues an order on the merit, either party, and that means the employer or the claimant, can file with the administrator and serve on the opposing party and his or her representative a notice of intent to settle. They have 30 days to do that. Once that notice of intent to settle is served and filed, the appeal time is extended to 150 days unless within 14 days of the opposing party's receipt of the notice of intent to settle, an objection is filed with the administrator and appropriately served on the other side and the other side's representative. And if you have an objection filed, then the jurisdictional time limit uh, remains at 60 days. So you don't need to be a rocket scientist to see the problems that this could create depending on who is representing whom and depending on the particular claim. Um, it, in very limited cases, I think this could well be uh, utilized. And those are the cases where both parties know the case is going to be settled. There have probably been settlement negotiations as the claim was working through the commission. Uh, valuations and uh, uh, exposures have been looked at and the parties pretty well know where the, where the truth lies and what their true intent is. I think in those cases, this probably makes sense because it allows the parties 150 days to wrap up and file the settlement documents uh, and avoid uh, going into a common pleas court. However, uh, in those cases where settlement has never been discussed and where the discovery and information about the claim uh, and, and complete medical records have not been obtained, personally, I don't see how uh, parties can do this in the amount of time allowed and by by risking uh, an important right. And we've always argued that the appeal to court is perhaps the employer's most important weapon to manage and close down claim. So I think there's a limited utility in this provision. I think it's, it is uh, a provision that certain individuals could play games with. And uh, depending on how the thing plays out, a party may, be, uh, may have only 16 days to file its notice of appeal after the intent to settle is uh, filed, and the other party waits till the 14th day to object. So you've got to be very careful on this. Personally, I, I, I don't understand it. I, I kind of see a reason for it. But if you're going to settle a claim, you can settle it and put a notice of appeal, file the notice of appeal, and just dismiss it once the settlement is completed. I think that's a very good point. And the other part of this is, what is an intent to settle? If you have a letter before the SHO order saying, well, hey, you know, you're interested in settling this claim, is that an intent to settle? Does that meet the requirements of the statute? The statute doesn't say. Where that can be a big game is, if somebody blows their 60 days, say, well, we wanted to settle this and we now have 150 days and you didn't object. And you say, well, I didn't know you wanted to settle. It's a, it's, it's a can of worms here. Just be very, very careful because the last thing uh, an employer wants to do is to waive its uh, right to appeal a claim to court if it's justified. One uh, minor change that comes up too is in these cases when you go to court, if you lose, currently under Ohio law, you can pay up to $4,200 of the injured worker claimant's attorney's fee. The new law changes that, Greg. Yeah, it, it ups it to $5,000 if the claimant is successful in court. And that means at trial, summary judgment, and if the employer just walks away from it, that attorney fee is payable. The last slide we have today is handicap reimbursements, and then we're going to come back and answer some questions here that have been sent in. Um, handicap reimbursements, under the current law, there's been a question 
as to if a claim is settled, does that bar your right to a handicap reimbursement? The statute didn't specifically address that. The Bureau rule did talk about it. But as a practical matter, I think the Bureau, for the most part, was allowing that to happen, uh, allowing the claim to be uh, uh, still considered a handicap reimbursement. The new law clarifies some things on that. And, and Greg, what, what does that do? It basically says that a settlement of a claim does not bar an employer from seeking handicap reimbursement relief. That's number one. Number two, the settlement amount is, is deemed an award of compensation that would be subject to the reimbursement, the handicap reimbursement. Uh, so that's a very positive for an employer. And, uh, you know, the, this change uh, raises a question as to whether or not if you've got a settled uh, claim and you're still within the period of time in which to file for a handicap reimbursement, which I think is um, the sixth year after the date of injury, are you able to do it? Or is that applying this statute uh, uh, retroactively rather than prospectively? Yeah, the Bureau has a rule that would indicate that you probably can do that uh, retrospectively in this case. So uh, that's something that I would definitely consider and uh, test. Okay, okay um, I guess we have some questions here. All right, for the death benefits, once the dependent gets out of jail, are they entitled and do they have to pay back pay as one payment and then ongoing? No, I think the period they're incarcerated would not be payable when they got out of jail. They would be entitled to benefits for that period. Uh, most death benefit pay payments are payable for the rest of their life unless they remarry or if they're a minor, reach majority. But uh, no, you would not back pay the period that they're in jail. Right. Does the recoupment of overpayment during the FWW period only apply to wages that were calculated at minimum rate? Meaning if an OP is discovered that didn't result from this calculation, an overpayment is discovered that didn't result from this calculation method, are we still prohibited to recoup within the first 12 weeks of disability? That's a good question. I'm not sure of the answer. I don't think that that would be subject to uh, this provision of the law, personally, but I, I can't tell you with a definitive answer on that. Uh, Greg, do you? No, the recoupment is solely on the situation provided by the statute um, where, in fact, there were no wages and the individuals paid the minimum. Yeah, this provision, I think, just deals with that scenario. That may come up in another context or a separate motion, but I don't think it would be addressed with this. And someone else wants to know, so please clarify that this applies to state fund claims only. Are there any of these provisions that apply to state fund claims only? I'm not sure which slide this came in on. Well, the, the law applies to to everyone, but some of the context of this is just in the state fund context. For example, the drug change applies to self-insured employers and state fund employers. The waiver on the medical is state fund. Right, that because they're the only people that have the right to the 90-day exam to have the Bureau do it. Um, so uh, it really just depends. Uh, incarceration would apply to everyone. Uh, as Greg said, the medical examinations uh, are different. Uh, in the full weekly wage, that calculation, it wouldn't apply to self-insured employers because self-insured employers pay their own, uh, they, they set them themselves and they pay them, so it wouldn't apply there. Permanent partial disability application, that would apply to both. Uh, I'm trying to think, did I get them all here? Appeals to court apply to both. Handicap applies to everybody who has it opted out. Yeah, the pr practical problem is most self-insured employers have opted out and um, as we're learning, that may not have been a good thing, uh, but that was the bromide at the time that came around. I think that was the change in um, 2006, or, or I'm not sure which one. Might have been, might have been before that, but uh, uh, it was the same time as we had the Cisco opt-out provision. All the questions for you. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Ho hopefully you learned one or two uh, things about the new legislation. Thank you, and have a good day, everybody.